Hey folks, if you're watching this video, you're obviously very interested to learn more about the single bevel and bi-bevel rods found in the Clovis era assemblages. This video really just isolates the single bevel and bi-bevel rods and their application within the Clovis assemblage and it's just the clippings out of the larger lecture on hafting Clovis. So if you're interested in watching the full version of that, we'll have a link drop down in the description. So very confident that the atlatl is what is delivering the spear shaft, which is also tipped with relatively small projectile points that are most closely associated with megafauna, proboscideans, you know, any sort of elephant species, mammoths, mastodons, even the gompotheres, and then also bison and ticus. So moving on now to the single beveled and pointed antler bone ivory uh, points just like this or pieces and I absolutely believe that these are a projectile point and so they are single beveled on one side which lends itself and they're actually scored as well typically all the way around to give a good mating surface so when you attach these to a foreshaft or a spear shaft with this lap jointed system glue it with a pine pitch glue which we know has been around for a very long time and then wrap it with animal tendons and that creates a very secure hafting joint and so that can withstand a tremendous amount of force being exerted on it through penetration and also quite a bit of side to side flex as we can actually use these lap joints as you'll come to find out in the middle of the spear shaft which flexes in flight especially upon initial launching and they're very very strong joints and they are apparent on almost all of the pieces that we find within the beveled rods, bi-beveled rods, single beveled rods in the Clovis assemblage. So these pieces here that we looked at made from bone antler or ivory uh, for a while were thought to have been four shafts sticking down into the end of spear shafts and there's a couple problems with that number one they're they're quite sharp at the distal end so they're really made for penetration there would be no reason to severely taper and sharpen the tip if it was going to sit down into a four shaft like this because as it as it gets force pressed into it with penetration it's only going to promote it to penetrate you'd actually want to blunt this off and round it not sharpen it and then if we look at let's say we'll start with this diagram here as we've already discussed attaching to the end of a four shaft or a spear shaft itself with that lap joint this makes a projectile point that although it doesn't have a lot of lacerative qualities meaning it doesn't have any cutting edges so it's not really going to cut when it goes in I don't know anybody that would want this thing running through them either. So it's a great hole poker, but also keep in mind that these would be exceptionally good for practicing and then also using on small game. So you could actually throw these at stuff like rabbits as well and actually pin them to the ground with these, uh, these spike style of points where you can then also while you're carrying all your spears as a nomadic person, if you come across animals and you're throwing spears, these can also be implemented in your big game hunting as large hole poking projectiles, where if you watch the Clovis documentary we previous did, we showed that the simple hardwood tipped spear shafts, so just spear shafts with no sort of point other than the natural hardwood, which would be fire hardened and sharpened, really lacked in penetration and sometimes completely bounced off because the tip of wood is so soft that it rolls where the tip of bone antler and ivory is very hard and therefore will not roll upon impact and you'll get penetration. So all of that stuff put together really shows that these are great projectile points with a multi-purpose use. One of the things that these have been proposed to be used for is found here in the second drawing which is a great idea and modern humans love to over engineer things right so we love to sit down and get our minds working and say man we could we could put this together and we would have all these pieces and it would be so cool and this is exactly how it worked and we have to remember that although these people were really intelligent and they made very fine pieces over engineering this stuff as modern humans 
is really pointless to early people. The simplest answer, it's not that they're not smart enough to do it, there absolutely are, but the simplest answer is oftentimes the best answer. And the reason is, is because the more pieces that you have put together, the greater risk of failure that will occur in a hunting scenario. So the least amount of pieces that you can put together and have to make all of these different components and then marry them together, we're decreasing the time of manufacture and we're also decreasing the amount of failure of this whole system in a hunt by basically getting rid of it. So what I'm saying is the more work, the more moving parts, the more in little intricate pieces you put together, the higher chance of failure and then also the higher time of manufacture. So what has been proposed in the past was that the sharpened ends of the single beveled rods were four shafts that set down into a main shaft, but also keep in mind that a lot of these are as, as short as four inches, sometimes even less, and then as great as 16 inches, which that's fine, but those are the longer ivory ones that they would find, especially like down in Florida. So very short, much like this one here, it's about, I don't know, about six inches. So if this sat down into a four shaft, you would be looking at about, all about four inches or so exposed, and then a point. And we'll talk about the penetrative qualities in a little while, we'll, so we'll move on from there. But if this was to set down in, and then the idea is that this would be the side profile of the Clovis point, and that it would marry onto the side of the fluting, and then another additional piece, like a bone splint, would be made to tie this all together, and then wrap it up. Well, the big problem that you're gonna find here is when you take a Clovis point, and this is an actual, this is a cast of a real Clovis point, so it's plastic, but it's an exact cast copy, and if you take these lap jointed ends, or these beveled ends, and you set it on the bi-beveled, or the single beveled rod, you can see that the tip alignment is really far off. And tip alignment is really important for penetration because imagine if this was hafted like this at this really tilted angle and then you throw it into an animal, it's going to want to fold and break that point in half very, very easily. So it's going to not only break your point very often, but it's also going to really inhibit penetration into the animal because instead of all of the energy behind the spear shaft being focused on penetrating in and through the animal, it's going to deflect energy upon impact downwards or upwards or whichever way it's canted and it's going to create that leverage point which is robbing energy really needed for penetration of large Pleistocene mammals and most likely not only failing to penetrate but also deflecting energy down curving the penetration pattern of the projectile if not snapping the point altogether. So we have a significant issue with the way that these would be hafted on these beveled end pieces stuck down into a foreshaft. Also these bone splints, for all the research I've ever done, I have never seen a single splint that would fit on any of this found in the Clovis assemblage. However, there are bone antler and ivory artifacts found on Clovis uh, kill and manufacture sites, yet none of these bone splints seem to appear. So the other really big red flag in this is if these were set into drilled four shafts in the end of hardwood spears, that would require a tool known as, easy enough, a drill. And the major problem that we have is that these styles of drills are not found in the Clovis era. These long drills that would be used for actually drilling out the ends of hardwood spears do not come around until a couple thousand years 
after Clovis and really in the transitional paleo times, say around Dalton period, is when you really start seeing these drills showing up. So if you don't have the drill, then how are you drilling out the ends of hardwood spears? So what we're running into is we're really coming up with a lot of big problems with these being used as four shafts because we're lacking the drills in the Clovis assemblage. We're lacking the bone splint in the Clovis assemblage. The uh, tip alignment is horribly off on a beveled rod. And then also the tips are very sharp, which are not good for setting down into uh, these more rounded out drill face because very sharp drill tips break off so they have to be somewhat rounded. All that's going to do is jam that further down into the spear shaft even if you did drill it out. And then also the size of these as we move over and start showing this sitting down into where well, you would have to really bevel those in uh, the shoulders of the shaft which if you bevel the shoulders of the shaft in too hard now it makes this union where these two come together very flimsy even if you wrap that with sinew or gut material it still creates a very flimsy union very very thin and it promotes snapping especially if your tip alignment's off so if your tip alignment's off now you're getting extra torque especially using leverage down here at the union of the fore shaft and so it's going to snap that really really easily and if you leave it full fully shouldered then as you see here where I just messed it up with my finger the really pronounced shoulders of a spear shaft that has a four shaft stuck down in it is going to drastically inhibit penetration so if you're talking about point or these if these were four shafts which we know they're not but if they were and this was set down in and we only had a couple inches then there's really little penetration going on because these hard stopped shoulders will absolutely stop penetration and we know that because we also specifically make our cane spear shafts which we'll talk about in a moment but we specifically make our cane spear shafts with these long hardwood four shafts that will penetrate in deep into the animal and then they stop penetration and so these smooth transitions as you can see on this point here slide cleanly over there's really no hang-ups and penetration it slides right through and then it stops and the reason is is because we actually don't want to penetrate up into the main shaft of our spear shaft and the reason for that is going to come when we start discussing the bibeveled rods but in some of the hardwood shafts penetration is only going to be limited to the first foot or two foot anyway and so breakages at the end are fairly common and if you are using large river cane shafts which were likely available to clovis people however only to the southeastern most clovis people perhaps as far over as texas along the gulf coast and then only as far north as about northern Georgia would you would be able to find in the Pleistocene or at the, or at the Younger Dryas very large river cane because out west and then the northern states as we know them today the river cane it's too cold of a climate and it won't grow so modern day river cane grows about as far north as southern Ohio sometimes getting up into Maryland a little bit uh, because it's closer to the coast and it's just slightly warmer typically uh, but during the Pleistocene you would find that climates in Florida today would be much like North Carolina today so and that's how it would be back in the Pleistocene so basically Florida would be like same temperature say as North Carolina Tennessee and so when you look at the lines of where river cane grows that line is going to get shoved down and you're going to be looking at at the very farthest reaches of river cane probably North Georgia North Alabama very very like South Missouri possibly um, so they had some access to it but then that does not account for everything north so you could implement as we do here and we'll touch on this the four shaft system into river cane but that does not account for the hardwood shafts being used in places 
absent of river cane. So if we go back to these, you would not implement these with the river cane, especially because the internodal chambers, meaning the nodes on the river cane, just like bamboo, it's a North American bamboo, these very sharp points upon impact would easily jam right through those internodal chambers, which are typically fairly solid. And the best thing about like a cane shaft is it doesn't require any drilling. So there is possibility that Clovis people utilizing river cane because it's a very, very good material to use. You'll find through some of our future videos that anthropologically speaking, everybody wants to use cane if they have cane because it's just that good. But that being said, if you utilize these very sharp, uh, single beveled pointed rods into river cane that requires no drilling because we don't have a drill, they'll punch through the internodal chamber which decreases uh, penetration, which will also then split your cane shaft, rendering it essentially useless. All right, so now we'll move on to discussing the bi-beveled rods, which are found in the Clovis assemblage. And that was another thought, again, that maybe these were lap jointed onto a spear shaft, much like this one here, and then utilizing this same bone splint idea to haft uh, lap joint onto the main spear shaft and then lap joint onto the projectile which we've already discussed is a, is a really inefficient way of attaching Clovis points and although that lap joint is perfect for attaching rods and other spear shaft pieces together so where does the bi beveled rod come into play well as you can see on our spear shaft here what you will notice is that when you're out hunting and you spear animals you are oftentimes, especially with hardwood that doesn't have inset four shafts, and you may have over penetration, what you're gonna find is the wood will eventually break because as the animal gets speared, it's gonna run and it's either gonna hit that spear shaft on brush or other animals in the herd. It's gonna be running with them in the herd and it's gonna run by another one that's running this way or it's gonna run past it or it's gonna lean down and drag on the ground and it's gonna buckle that spear shaft or it's gonna fall onto the spear shaft and it's gonna break it. So we see through our hunts all the time because that's what we do here at Hunt Primitive is we do a lot of primitive hunts is we break a lot of shafts. And so when you break these shafts, wood doesn't just break off super clean where you can just put it back together. And these lap joints are actually very strong joints and resist quite a bit of breakage. So if it doesn't break at the lap joint, or if it does and it splits the, the lap joint, then what you're gonna find is not only do you have a lot of splintering happening at the hardwood shaft, but you're gonna have a lot of splits that run up through. If you take a stick and you bend it and break it, a lot of times you'll find it doesn't just break clean and stop. Sometimes as it breaks, it splinters and those cracks will run deep into the spear shaft, which severely compromise its structural integrity. And so what you can do is if you just looking at your break and you've got splits from the break, if you simply cut these and beveled them and married them together, now what happens is your spear shaft gets shorter. And you might be able to do that once and get away with it, but the length of your spear shaft is very important to the balance of how your atlatl system is when you're gonna throw it. A very short spear doesn't have the proper balance in the atlatl and tends to fly uh, relatively erratic, it's hard to be very accurate with it, and tends to fly with a knock end down as you release it. And a very long spear shaft is so nose heavy that it's very hard to throw accurately without it wanting to take a nose dive. So the balance between the spear shaft and the atlatl is crucial. And so maintaining a relative length of your spear shafts that match your atlatl or your throwing component is really important. So if you have a break, what you can do is you can cut these ends off that are broken and now you can implement the use of a bi-beveled rod that now is a patch and repair on your spear shaft that allows you to maintain the same length of your spear shaft. And 
as we know that that's really important for balance, why on earth wouldn't you just make a whole new spear shaft? Well, there's a lot of work that goes into straightening spear shafts out, also fletching, dialing in, making sure they're tuned really well. Also the hafting component, which if the haft actually may not be broke, it may have penetrated into the animal and maybe the pitch came loose, but all you have to do is just reheat it and set it. So all the time that it took to half the point and the material it took to half the point, maybe that's not compromised at all, but the shaft is broke. So instead of starting over from scratch, you're going to make a repair. Well, your repairs, especially out in the plains or the tundra type uh, habitats, you're going to find wood is not as common as it is say in the east today. So anybody that's been out through the Great Plains, you can cover some pretty big distances following large mammals, especially bison, which were heavily hunted by Clovis people. If you follow these bison around, you're probably going to find yourself in locations that are absent of a lot of good quality wood. Now some of the lower quality woods are very soft and they split easier, but they also work easier and they were probably used. But if you find yourself out on the plains or out on the tundra and you're hunting bison, or mammoths or what have you, and you have a broken spear shaft, what you're probably going to find is you have a lot of access to bone and ivory. And although it takes much longer to build that, by beveled rod out of bone or ivory, you also know the chances of that component breaking are relatively slim compared to the wood. And so what you would probably find is a lot more of these by beveled rods being utilized in places that have lower wood resources overall. If you like this video and you want to watch more about this specific topic, you can click the link down in the description for the full length uh, lecture on Hafton Clovis and then also to the full length documentary on hunting with Clovis.